Um, welcome everyone to our third lecture of our OSSA lecture series. I'm so thankful and happy to have Dr. Sloboda giving us a lecture today. And a quick description is Dr. Sloboda's laboratory investigates early life impacts on maternal, fetal, and placental development and the risk of non-communicable diseases later in life. Her experimental studies investigate parental nutrient manipulation on pe pregnancy adaptations, including the microbiome, placental inflammation, and offspring reproductive and metabolic function. In community-based health studies, Dr. Sloboda engages with expectant mothers and services that support pregnant women developing community-based knowledge transfer and work programs to promote and advocate for health behaviors before and after conception. So um, the lecture will run for the course and then save your questions for the end or just drop them into the chat if you don't feel comfortable speaking up or unmuting yourself or showing your face. Also keep in mind that this is recorded. So um, for our internal use and then for Dr. Sloboda, if she wishes, she wishes, wishes to use that lecture afterwards, so just keep that in mind. And without further ado, thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for uh, the invitation, Israel. It's really nice to be here. Uh, first time I'm presenting to OSSA uh, and uh, thrilled to be doing this. Um, and thanks for the few people that have decided to come in the middle of August holidays before you get started back at school. All right. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about some of the things that we do in the Sloboda lab at McMaster University. But before I get started, I thought I might, I might just give you a really brief description of who I am and where I've come from. So I'm a fetal physiologist um, and I investigate how the fetus grows and the biology of how the fetus develops and grows over the course of pregnancy and how parental adaptations before and during pregnancy impact on health. So I'm a professor at McMaster University. I, I mainly do research um, and only teach about 10% of my time. So the majority of my time is spent doing research. And I thought I might tell you a little bit about where I came from too. So I did an undergrad uh, in human biology at Guelph. Uh, then I did a master's degree at Western in kinesiology. And then I did a PhD at the University of Toronto. That's where I did my work in fetal physiology. Following that, I traveled abroad to the west coast of Australia where I did a postdoc at uh, UWA and then did another postdoc at the University of New Zealand. Uh, and in 2012, I ended up here at McMaster University um, and run now the Sloboda Lab. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do uh, and what sort of research uh, I do here since I do spend uh, the majority of my time doing research. So I want to start the talk today with um, asking you all just to reflect or even write it into the chat if you want to, <laughs> um, so we can engage in some discussion. Uh, so what is health? What does health mean to you? Um, and actually, how do we get it? And most individuals, when they think about if, if they were asked, you know, what determines your health um, and then reciprocally, what, what influences your disease risk? Most people, oh, and the diseases typically that we talk about um, might be type two diabetes, blood pressure, you know, heart disease, obesity, things, these kind of non-communicable diseases. And, and if you think about what factors might be influencing your, your health and disease risk, you might say to yourself that some of it will be dependent on your genetics or your epigenetics. Most people will say, well, you know, depending on what sort of food that I eat, how much of it I eat, when I eat it, how much activity I might get over the course of the day that, you know, all of these things combined certainly influence whether or not uh, I have a, a higher or lower risk of disease. But most um, individuals, what they don't consider is the time before, <laughs> before uh, the beginning. Uh, and that's uh, your early life environment, which also includes pre-pregnancy. So even before you were conceived, uh, as you were present half in an egg and half in a sperm, and that's what we're calling early life. So let's unpack that uh, just a little bit. And then define what exactly is early life. Um, so we define most easily early life as childhood or 
or uh, the developing fetus or the developing embryo, which has a maternal factor or a mother factor during over the course of pregnancy. So that's a really easy concept to, to understand. That that's the early life environment, early life development. Um, and but well before that, as I indicated in the previous slide, there's also the preconception environment, which of course then will also include paternal lineage factors or the father um, could be sperm, as well as maternal lineage factors, as I said before, the egg and the sperm together. Um, so early life is actually quite a broad, um, has a broad definition that really encompasses well before um, we actually think of a, a developing blastocyst or embryo or fetus. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's start here because this is usually where um, individuals think about in terms of early life environment and embryo and fetal development. Um, so if I were to ask you, you know, what kinds of factors um, could influence early life de um, development. Um, and again, you know, most people think immediately to food. That's, that's an obvious one. Uh, most pregnant individuals think about what they're eating, when they're eating it, whether they can eat it, right? There's lots of rules and regulations about the type of food that can be eaten and when, um, what, how much of it is being eaten, um, and even things like morning sickness, maybe <laughs> you can't even eat uh, at the beginning of pregnancy. However, I'm going to try and push you a little bit here to think about the environment as being much broader than those things that we actually have um, direct control over. And that's also the environment. Uh, so where the pregnant individual is in the globe and what type of environment they are actually in. So, um, you know, be really great if we were sitting on this beach. <laughs> I'm not sure where this is. Um, you might be here alone enjoying um, blue skies, or, or actually you might be in a very dense urban environment, um, perhaps with a lot of pollution and a lot of stress and noise stress. So all these, all these factors will influence the developmental environment. And you might then think, well, you know, that, that makes sense, I guess. That makes sense that those factors will influence early life development. But the question that we like to unpack in, in my lab is how exactly do these factors influence the early life environment? So let's, let's again, discuss how this might come to be. So I'm going to ask you just to picture um, the, a developing human here inside uh, of the uterus. Um, and you'll see that this developing human has a telephone and is communicating with someone. Um, and what I'll ask you to do is to think about the fact that the developing fetus is communicating via the pregnant individual through the placenta, which I'll say is like a telephone, um, and communicating uh, all sorts of different types of information. Uh, so these types of uh, information will normally be in the form of hormones, nutrients, or oxygen, and it uses this information to predict what kind of environment is outside of the uterus. And that's really important because this information is used to adapt to development, developmentally. Um, so these signals, these nutrients, oxygen levels, will change developmental trajectories and pathways so that this developing fetus is able to increase its chances of survival after birth and also um, technically to also improve its health uh, into adulthood because ultimately at the end of the day, what this developing human wants to do is to go on and reproduce. Uh, and so it's adapting for survival. So I'll ask you to think just about the fact that it's using information to predict the external environment for future success. Um, and you might say, well, that's very interesting theoretically, but does it actually happen? And do we have any evidence uh, of this actually being the case? And in fact, if you go into the ecological literature, um, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that 
early, the early life environment actually um, uses factors to change adult phenotype. And this is a classic example and um, is used quite often in the literature to describe this uh, very phenomenon. So here is a rodent, uh, a meadow vole, uh, and this pregnant meadow vole lives in North America, and some of you, depending on where you live, might have them in your backyard even. Um, and this pregnant meadow vole is special because when it is, depending on when it's pregnant and when it gives birth over the course of the year, its babies are um, born with, with an entirely different phenotype. So if the, if the pregnant meadow vole uh, is, is um, going to give birth late in the year, so in the fall, uh, the pups are born with a very, very thick coat of fur. And if the pups are born in the spring, so the pregnancy happens um, either you know, much, much earlier in the year and the pups are born in the spring, the pups are actually born with a very thin coat of fur. And, you know, on, you know, on the surface, it makes sense uh, that, of course, well, you need more fur uh, in the fall because it's going to be cold and you need less fur in the spring because it's going to be warm. But the question is, how exactly does an in utero fetus identify the fact that it's being born at two different times of the year? Um, it is not temperature because these are warm blooded animals and they maintain their body temperature. And it isn't nutrients because the amount of food that's present at these transitional time points in both fall and spring is about the same. Uh, so the question remains, how exactly is this happening? How can, it, uh, how can the fetus actually see the external environment? And of course it can't. And what, um, what does happen is that there are, are changes in maternal endocrine signals, so hormonal signals, um, that are, that are um, indicating to the fetus via melatonin, which is changed with day length, that acts as a signal to the developing fetus that, hey, days are longer or days are shorter, and you're going to have to adapt your development to change the amount of fur uh, that you're born with to ensure survival. So the other, another example of this is actually in trees uh, and not in mammals or animals at all. Uh, trees also produce offspring, except in this case, they're called clones uh, and their early life environment is the seed. And if we cold germinate seeds, the offspring of those cold germinated seeds bud very late in the season because they anticipate cold weather. And if the seeds are germinated in the warm, the offspring bud very early, taking advantage of the warm weather uh, environment. So there's another example far away from even fetuses and embryos to show you that exact same um, phenomenon. And then finally, uh, there's the same phenomenon in insects. So bees, um, the majority of bees in a hive are usually worker bees, um, and really only uh, one queen is, um, is, um, survives in one hive. So how, in fact, if there is a new hive being born or being started, uh, do you actually make a queen if the majority of them actually are worker bees? And the way in which uh, that occurs is that baby bees, uh, which, which are larvae, um, are fed royal jelly to make a queen. And I'm not making that up. Uh, the royal jelly uh, is fed to a larva and then that produces a queen, whereas all the other larvae that are better fed honey produce worker bees. So there's another example of how factors um, during this early life environment can actually change postnatal adult phenotype. So um, that's great, but we're, we're neither uh, bees or voles or trees, but we are humans and, and humans are quite complex. Um, uh, uh, mammals, our environment is constantly changing. Um, in fact, we control much of our environment. So we uh, intentionally change our environment and we are also exposed to many, many si signals, often simultaneously. So one would imagine that using information as a prediction uh, to the external environment and adapting to that information is pretty tricky, um, particularly for humans and upper level uh, mammals. And 
in essence, it, if all goes well, all the signals that are given to a developing human a change adaptation, and that changes in adaptation result in long term uh, health and well being and to a, a phenotype that is very well suited to the environment within which it's born to. However, if it doesn't go well, and if the signals are are inappropriate, or they actually don't predict the external environment, that is when these signals might contribute to disease and or poor survival. Um, so if this is actually the case, can an embryo or fetus be misinformed and does it lead to disease? So the most obvious cases of misinformation in humans are recreational drugs, pharmaceutical exposures, um, all of these things that cross the placenta and get into the fetal circulation are not representative of the external environment necessarily that the fetus um, is eventually going to be born into. So it causes some very significant adaptations and some would say very significant teratogenic or pathological impacts. But you can also have much subtler changes um, that, that also don't reflect the postnatal environment. Things like um, maternal disease or metabolism, particularly inflammatory diseases like asthma, periodontal disease, infection is another one. Um, so all of these things may misinform the fetus and may change um, developmental adaptation. And one other quite subtle uh, factor then might be um, nutrition and diet because very subtle changes in um, the types of calories or the amount of calories that um, the fetus may receive will also result in quite subtle changes over long term in uh, postnatal phenotype. And this whole concept of uh, subtle changes and influences and factors that influence early life development that end up changing postnatal adult phenotype um, is all under the umbrella of a concept called the developmental origins of health and disease or developmental programming. And it was coined quite a long time ago, actually, um, by David Barker in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And the reason um, he was seminal in uh, starting this line of research is because he uh, identified a significant association between birth weight and the risk of developing something that we used to think was entirely a lifestyle associated disease. So let me just walk you through this graph. On the x-axis is birth weight of babies uh, in pounds, and on the y-axis is the odds risk or chance of having type 2 diabetes. Um, what David Barker did was he looked at historical data sets and linked birth weight to adult uh, diabetes risk. Um, this population set was primarily in adult men in the UK. But what he found was that those individuals who were born quite um, or smaller than the median here or the mean at seven and a half pounds had a much higher risk of, of developing type two diabetes as adults. Um, the other interesting thing about his data set is that it wasn't a linear association. So you can see here that very big babies also had an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes as adults. And what was interesting in these data were the fact that we already knew about the upper end of birth weight. We knew that large birth weight um, babies do have a higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. They tended to be born to individuals that already had diabetes or gestational diabetes. But what he identified was the left-hand end of the birth weight spectrum, which actually not only showed an increase, but also a much higher increase than those babies that are born large. So this started to um, flourish and uh, as a field, uh, as I said, in the late 1980s, this, these were published in 1986, many people started to wonder why was this association there and why is this true? Because of course, in the 1980s, type two diabetes was entirely associated with lifestyle, diet, 
um, and, uh, and exercise. Um, and it wasn't considered something that you could um, potentially control very early in life or have no control um, postnatally. And so when David identified this association, he went on to look at other data sets because he was principally interested in what actually is fundamentally at the root of this association. And he looked to another historical data set, which he had an opportunity to work with because of his collaborators in the Netherlands. And so they investigated um, nutritional impacts over the course of pregnancy, because of course, nutrition is a very big um, player in fetal growth. And what they did was they looked at data um, that uh, data on offspring that were born after the Dutch hunger winter. And for those of you that have never heard of this, the Dutch hunger winter was a period of time late in the Second World War, where the Nazis, um, they were, they had identified that they were losing the war and they circulated and, and really confined themselves to this one area, a small area in the Netherlands, um, where all communication was lost. And during this time, um, the really the rations went from low wartime rations to famine rations. Um, many thousands of people were affected by famine and cold, and among them were pregnant uh, women. And among them were pregnant women that were uh, in the beginning, mid, and end of pregnancy. And so what um, the researchers were able to do was to find out who was born after the Dutch hunger winter um, and um, identify who they were, whether when they were exposed as embryos and fetuses, and then follow them up years later to identify what was happening to their phenotype um, that much later. Uh, I think they were in their 60s and 70s, um, uh, the individuals later. And what they found was that the impacts of maternal famine on uh, on adult phenotype was quite significant, and it was dependent on when the exposure occurred, relative um, early versus late um, pregnancy. But in general, what they found was that adult offspring showed increased rates of glucose intolerance, coronary heart disease, high lipid profiles, um, lots of uh, stress responses, obesity. So those lifestyle associated diseases that I had mentioned earlier, but they also found other things like increased risks of breast cancer, increased risk of schizophrenia. So it really started to expand the field. Um, and more and more people started to wonder how many of the diseases that we've been identifying as kind of a postnatal onset actually have their origins very early in life. So that is where, um, where we have been concentrating our efforts for the last 15 years in the Sloboda lab. We are looking at all the different stages of life. We use both preclinical and clinical um, samples um, to unpack what some of the molecular um, biology is behind the signaling and how uh, an understanding of the signaling pathways may lead us into potentially intervening really early in life to reduce the incidence of those, again, non-communicable um, diseases that we thought were largely postnatal in, um, in their nature. And so we look at how this is all happening. And also we do experiments to understand the biology. We look at all sorts of different factors that could potentially influence um, growth and development and metabolic risk. And we look at both fetal development, placental development, and we also look at maternal and paternal influences over the course of pregnancy. So I'm really for the next 10 minutes going to show you just snapshots of some of the things um, that we do uh, in the lab to uncover uh, some of the mystery behind this. Uh, as I said, we use both preclinical and clinical models. Um, the animal models that we use um, typically uh, are either pre-pregnancy or pregnancy, where we have different groups of mice that are fed different types of diets. We do concentrate mostly on um, nutritional um, modeling, so changing the amount of fat that they might be consuming. We've also done some uh, caloric restriction studies. We've also looked at fructose. 
Um, and pre-pregnancy, we do great baseline measures. And I might add that we do this both in uh, the maternal and the paternal lineage. And then we look at pregnancy where we can either continue the control diet, switch them up, we can give them a high fat diet during pregnancy. Uh, we can collect samples over the course of pregnancy, depending on what we're interested in asking. So really early, mid or late pregnancy. And then we can also allow the offspring to be born and then follow up the offspring to see what happens to them after. And we can even manipulate the offspring uh, diet thereafter to see how how changing diet postnatally will influence what they, um, what the adult phenotype is. And we use all different types of mice, again, depending on the research question uh, that we're asking. We have um, in the last five years done quite a bit of work to understand different signaling pathways that were um, largely unexplored during pregnancy. And one of them is um, the maternal microbiome and the maternal gut. Uh, we know that the mother makes lots of physiological changes over the course of pregnancy uh, to adapt to pregnancy to ensure fetal growth and development, but largely unexplored was the maternal microbiome and the maternal gut, um, which is, I guess, surprising <laughs> given the fact that the gut is a, the, one of the biggest immune uh, immune. Um, systems in our body and also the key to nutrient absorption. So uh, I guess all of us reproductive biologists should have been looking at this much earlier, but you know, alas, we were not. Um, and so some of the questions that we ask is how our gut microbes participate in uh, shaping our early development. Um, this is still really unclear. We do know that the mother, um, the maternal environment over the course of pregnancy does change the microbial uh, community that harbors, uh, that she harbors in her gut. Um, but what we don't know is really what the signaling factors are and what are some of the pathways. So, so we're uncovering a lot of that. We also wanna look at it in the context of high uh, adiposity over the course of pregnancy. We do know that the microbes change. That much we do know. We have lots of uh, other data, but I'll just introduce you to this if you haven't seen it before. These are called um, taxa plots. Um, and all of these bars here represent individual mice over the course of pregnancy. And this big thick one on the left here with all the different colors is just an average of all the mice. All of the colors represent different microbes and the amount of color represents how uh, the abundance of that microbe. So if you ever see this in any of your publications, if you're not familiar with it, that's what it means. Um, so what we did was simply just to look at microbial composition in pregnant mice that were fed a control diet and those that were fed a diet um, that induced obesity over the pregnancy. And we showed a really nice interaction between pregnancy and diet on the maternal gut uh, microbiome. So certainly uh, it is manipulable just like it is postnatally or prenatally. And we also know uh, that in the context of changing a diet, the maternal gut structure also changes. We looked at um, just histologically looking at um, the villi uh, in the gut of a pregnant mouse. And we saw that villus density is disrupted in those fed a high fat diet. And we also know that mucins, which are those proteins that make up the mucosal layer in, uh, in your gut that provide you with a barrier, um, which are seen here in blue are also decreased in those mice that are pregnant and fed a high fat diet. We also know the cells, the goblet cells that secrete these um, barrier mucins uh, are also decreased. So we know that the pregnant gut can respond to diet much the same as a non-pregnant gut and that wasn't, that wasn't known uh, before. Now, as I said earlier, the gut is one of uh, the most important and largest immune, um, immune organs in our body. So we're also interested in understanding immunophenotyping in the context of high maternal adiposity. Uh, we do this in collaboration with Dr. Da uh, Don Bowdish, an immunobiologist, uh, and Jessica Bresnik. 
Um, we're interested in this because we know that tissue immune cells, so principally macrophage, that type of immune cell, they originate from another immune cell that circulates um, in your blood called monocytes, uh, and that they come out of your bone marrow. And in the context of um, diet-induced obesity, that these immune cells end up in adipose tissue and also in other metabolic tissue. And when they do that, they secrete high levels of uh, proteins called cytokines that induce local inflammation. Uh, and this local inflammation leads to systemic inflammation, and this ends up changing metabolism and influencing insulin um, action and insulin resistance. So this is known in the non-pregnant context. Uh, but what we want to know also is, this, does, does this apply to pregnancy and how does it change in pregnancy? And since these specialized immune cells come out of bone marrow and out of, out of circulation and end up in tissue, could these immune cells also embed themselves in the placenta? And if they do, then what happens to placental function? And so uh, immune cells during pregnancy are really, really important. Uh, and it's really important to understand immune cells over the course of pregnancy, particularly if they're not functioning properly. So this is just a cross section here uh, of a placenta. And the maternal decidua here, you see here, is that tissue that the mother has, uh, or the, um, the pregnant individual has before pregnancy. So it's, it's the endometrium that then becomes the maternal decidua over the course of pregnancy. Um, and what happens here is that in the non-pregnant context, the endothelial lining of the uterus has um, vessels. This is, this is a cross-section of the blood vessel has lots of smooth muscle around it. It's really thick. It's got endothelial cells lining it. And as soon as pregnancy occurs, specialized immune cells begin to trans, um, translocate across the maternal tissue, and they actually invade maternal arteries. Uh, and here are these specialized um, cells called trophoblast cells. They're of fetal origin and these specialized immune cells. And what they do is they completely remodel this artery so that it becomes a very, very large, low pressure artery because you need low resistance. Uh, you, yeah, you need low resistance to ensure high volume going to the placenta. And this happens completely normally. Um, there, uh, there are lots and lots of immune cell adaptations. So, so we're wondering if immune cells don't do this and if um, they're ending up somewhere else and creating lots of inflammation, then what happens to uh, the placenta and what happens to fetal growth? And this is just an example of some of the things that could be happening. So this is a cross section of a mouse embryo at um, 10 and a half days of gestation. Um, the end is about, depending on the strain, somewhere between 19 and 21. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of what we look at down the microscope when we collect it. So again, here is that maternal origin tissue at the top, the decidua, the placental. Uh, sections here are fetal origin, and here is where the, you know, the embryo and fetus would sit. And we are interested in looking at what cells might be hypoxic, meaning that they have a lack of oxygen, um, resulting from the fact that those arteries aren't remodeled properly. We want to look at the different immune cells. We want to look if cells are proliferating or not, so dividing. And then this is that remodeling that I was telling you about is does it occur properly or does it not? Um, so those are, that's a really brief snapshot of some of the things we do um, during pregnancy uh, over the, uh, just to identify factors that could be influencing embryonic and uh, fetal growth. But it's also important to remember that, uh, as I said before, the early life environment is not just about pregnancy. 
um, because uh, that's really where most people place most of the responsibility and burden is on pregnant individuals. Um, and so we want to remove that responsibility and to take the burden off of pregnant individuals by telling people uh, about all of the um, all of the windows of early life development and not just um, a pregnancy. And that's where uh, the paternal lineage comes in. So when an individual thinks about how do you grow the best baby, very rarely does somebody say you have to find the best paternal lineage. It's usually about nutrients, exercise, making sure that the pregnant individual is healthy, free of drugs. So very rarely do we consider this preconception period and it's equally important. So that's what I'm gonna take you through uh, right now. So obviously paternal influences are an extremely important part of the early life environment. Uh, we know that, whoops, I missed a slide. Well, that's okay. Uh, we know that if we change the paternal uh, diet, uh, that you get very significant changes in, um, in offspring. And here, this is what we did in, uh, in mice. So what we did here was we fed male mice a high fat diet, induced obesity, then took those male mice, impregnated uh, control fed um, females, and created pregnancies and then looked at the offspring. So what you see here are offspring that are born of um, high fat fed males. Uh, and you see here, this is a blood glucose curve. So what we do is we give them a bolus of glucose here, um, uh, right here. Then we measure how quickly glucose is cleared. And you can see here that in the offspring whose um, fathers actually were obese because of a high fat diet. They have poor glucose tolerance because their glucose is higher than the control fed ones. And we also know that whole body metabolism is also altered. So here I've got it divided. Um, these are all females. These are uh, female offspring born to control fathers and female offspring born to high fat fed fathers in the pink. And so they eat more over the course of a day. This is a 24 hour day period where we monitor the animals and in both the dark period and the light period. So like, as I said, 24 hours, uh, they're eating more and they're actually producing less heat, meaning that their basal metabolism is slightly lower. So in essence, adult female offspring of high fat fed dads are glucose intolerant, they eat more and they produce less heat. So there's some very significant associations between adult phenotype and paternal lineage early life factors. And we sell similar things in our male offspring. So Probably if I ask you, what do you think is governing this? Um, most people will of course say the sperm because that is one of the major paternal influences on early life um, is the donation of, of sperm. But, and, and of course we do know and other people uh, in the literature have investigated what happens to sperm and sperm epigenetic regulation of gene expression um, when you change paternal diet. And there's lots and lots of literature now showing that if you change diet in males, that spermatogenic epigenetics is altered. And it could be at the level of DNA methylation, histone modifications, non-coding RNAs. There's lots of data on that. So certainly some of the outcomes that we see in our studies may be due to spermatogenic epigenetic changes. However, there is a whole other um, part of biology that most people don't know about, and that is the fact that not just sperm, but also seminal fluid is equally important and in fact participates actively in the formation of the placenta. And you'll recall that I said that the placenta is that telephone that the fetus uses to communicate with the, with the um, mother 
to determine what the external environment is. So if that telephone isn't working properly and it is due entirely to a paternal lineage um, change, then in fact, nothing that happens over the course of pregnancy um, really uh, that that pregnant individual could do would change it because it's of paternal origin. So that's why I said that um, we really have to start to think about early life development and pregnancy as a responsibility for just more to um, as a responsibility of more than just the pregnant individual. And in fact, seminal fluid influences how the uterus prepares for the incoming embryo just before uh, conception. And lots of people don't know that. So here's just a diagram of how that might occur. So seminal fluid actually primes the uterus to secrete special proteins, cytokines, um, to prepare this bed <laughs> that the embryo is going to implant in. And this is when more of those um, immune cells come to play. Uh, and you'll remember that I said that those immune cells are really important in remodeling arteries and ensuring blood flow. So if this environment that is both maternally and paternally controlled isn't adequate or changes drastically, not only do you have changes in uh, implantation, but you also might have changes in the maternal immune response and vascular remodeling of those arteries, which then downstream leads to changes in placental development. And because the placenta is that telephone, then that's gonna influence fetal growth. And we have new data telling us that if we looked, uh, when we look at the seminal fluid of those mice that we fed a high fat diet to, and these are males, remember, uh, we do show very drastic changes in really important cytokines that actually um, communicate with the maternal tissue to influence different types of immune cells. And does this lead to anything? Uh, well, in fact, we know that the placenta that these fathers produce, and remember that we only fed a high fat diet to the fathers, and these placenta are the result of pregnancies that result from these males, they end up with significantly higher amounts of proteins that indicate to us that the placenta is hypoxic, so it has less oxygen in the placenta. And we also know that the blood vessels that are within the placenta are um, have a different amount of smooth muscle actin, which is a protein that stabilizes these, these arteries. So we know that there's something wrong with the way in which the vessels um, are formed and uh, their integrity um, is not uh, where it should be. So we think that um, the paternal environment actually really significantly changes placental vessel structure, development, and results in changes in placental function. So I don't have time to talk to you today about the uh, the maternal uh, aspects, but rest assured that we are looking at, um, at oocytes and we do have some data showing that oocytes are altered um, in offspring that uh, are born uh, in either of the models that I've shown you today. Um, but I haven't got time really to talk to you about that. So I'm gonna move along. Uh, so hopefully I've convinced you that uh, you know, when we, you think about health over long term, that health starts here at eggs and sperm, <laughs> not, and it doesn't start, um, you know, in your 20s when you're thinking about what you're eating and what you do, uh, that this is where health starts because um, the egg and sperm come together to produce small embryos, then produce uh, fetuses. And of course, these fetuses are born as children, develop into adolescents, develop into, into adults. And if you may imagine that each one of these windows is vulnerable to influences uh, that might then go on to impact sperm and egg for the next generation. And you'll just notice here, I've got an arrow pointing to this purple dot. Um, and I just wanna highlight the fact that every developing 
uh, fetus has its own set of germ cells. So not only are factors going to impact this one generation all along, but it's also going to impact the next generation uh, because these are developing sperm and egg and they are the future uh, grandchildren. So that is why when we think about early life, we also include adolescence in our timeline of early life and so really it's a life course approach to understanding health and disease. It's not just about uh, a postnatal change uh, in your lifestyle, it's an entire um, cycle over many generations. So hopefully the next time somebody asks you this question, you won't forget about this time period at the beginning uh, and that you'll remember that all of these things interact to influence our, our health and disease risk. And I'll, leave you with, um, I've got about two more minutes and then we've got some questions if you want to ask questions. Um, I'll leave you with a thought about why should community support then individuals that intend on becoming pregnant, individuals that are pregnant or individuals that have just been pregnant. Um, and from our perspective, it's obviously because if we invest early then we can support individuals to have an entire life course approach to health and disease risk rather than just targeting one part of, of our whole pathway and we'll have better outcomes in the end. So the question is, does our community know about this? And I, I would love to hear either in the chat or a show of hands later of uh, if anybody has ever heard of this before um, listening to me. I know at least one of you have because I know Helen in the, uh, in the audience. Um, and a few years ago, we embarked on a study to ask this just this question. And what we did was we formed a team of people that worked with Hamilton Public Health Services and midwives and a number of different services across Hamilton um, to establish a study called the Mothers to Babies Study. Here we had and surveyed about 400 pregnant women living in Hamilton, and we asked them a whole bunch of questionnaires which we were then able to uh, deduce how much knowledge do they have about this early origins concept? How much just general pregnancy knowledge do they have? And we were interested to know uh, what type of diet they were eating when they were answering this question, these questions. And what we found was uh, the good news is that most individuals that we surveyed had really good general health knowledge during pregnancy. They knew all of the Canada health guidelines. They knew what their physicians were offering them and recommending to them. So most of them really had a great pregnancy health knowledge. Unfortunately, in urban Hamilton, not a lot of them were eating a, a really healthy diet, which is probably not surprising given our urban center most of them were eating a really relatively moderate diet and a lot of them actually were eating not a lot of healthy foods, which despite the fact of having really high pregnancy health knowledge, they still weren't eating a healthy diet, which means that there are lots of other factors other than just education and knowledge that we have to do to make sure that people have access to healthy foods. And then finally, we asked them just general questions um, geared towards understanding early origins health. And probably not surprising, pretty low early origins health knowledge. So really not a lot of people know uh, about any of these concepts that I've uh, introduced to you today. And there's a big knowledge gap. So in order to communicate these concepts to the public, we need new approaches to share information. And so what we have developed is an arts-based knowledge translation program recently. Um, it is because art is accessible to many different cultures, genders, ages, across different outcomes. Art has the ability to evoke emotion. It empowers change. Lots of people can understand, you know, drawing and art, and they might not understand complex biology. And this project is called the Art of Creation Project. 
Uh, it is an arts-based health advocacy and education program. I'm not going to read all that since this is recorded. Um, you guys can go back and read it. Uh, but generally, we want to target and promote and advocate for healthy behavior and health behavior before and during pregnancy to everyone in the community and tell them about early origins of health. We have four different arms where we're engaging in focus groups, arts-based support groups, as well as arts-based responses to science and a public exhibition. Uh, I think I might just whip through that. The focus groups we're doing with artists and we're asking them uh, you know, what they think about using art to translate messages to the public. Um, so far, uh, you know, most artists think it's a great idea to do that. Um, in our art space focus groups, uh, we're working with pregnant individuals in Hamilton and we are still recruiting. So if you know anybody that is less than 25 weeks pregnant and lives in Hamilton and would like to participate, let us know. What we're doing with them is that we're doing a workshop with them uh, where I'm describing early origins to them, much the same as what I've done with you this evening. And then they're engaging in six different arts-based uh, focus groups. Um, they're getting photographed throughout pregnancy and then they're completing some surveys uh, so that we understand whether or not engaging with us improves um, their insights into early origins concepts. We are also, uh, we also are engaging with local Hamilton artists. We had a call for artists earlier in the year where we asked artists to join us. Um, what they've done is they've come to our laboratory after a workshop on early origin science. They were immersed in our laboratory for uh, four times for four weeks. And then they were given all the same messages you're receiving today and they get to ask questions, they get to interact with scientists in the laboratory, and then they, they um, create an art response uh, to what they've heard and a message uh, that they want to convey with their art. And then we end with uh, an exhibition. So basically they get to immerse themselves in the lab, see all the things that you've seen today, but also interact with scientists and ask questions. Um, and then all of this culminates into a public art exhibition, which is happening next year at the end of the year, um, where we're going to hold an exhibition first at the Art Gallery of Hamilton, and then it'll travel around Hamilton to other community uh, centers and schools. We're going to exhibit everything that I've just talked to you about, both from the professional artists as well as the pregnant participants and their reflection on early origins and pregnancy and what it's like to be pregnant in Hamilton. We're also going to collect data uh, throughout our exhibition so that we can figure out whether or not doing art space knowledge translation improves the public knowledge of early origin science. Uh, so if you want more information, uh, log on to our website at Art of Creation Study. You can also follow us on Instagram where we have lots of pictures of our artists in our laboratories and uh, our participants. Um, so that's pretty much uh, the end of the end of the talk. Uh, of course, I have to acknowledge every one in my lab on my amazing team that does all this awesome science and I just get to talk about it um, and all of the people uh, and institutions and funders that uh, help us uh, get this work done by giving us funding. Um, and I just want to stop with a plug <laughs> to McMaster University and, uh, and our biochem department. We've got a big department um, full of undergrads. We've got a whole bunch of different programs. Uh, both undergrad and, and, uh, and grad. We've got over 100 graduate students um, and uh, it's a great place to come if you're thinking about doing, uh, doing grad work. So I'm going to end it there uh, and open it up. If anybody has any questions, you can write it into the chat. Just unmute. Yep, thank you so much. Uh, our first question is from Abdullah. The presentation was... Uh, very informative and interesting. I was wondering if I could get your email. Okay, I'll just drop that into the <laughs> yeah. chat. Uh, Hafsa has a question. 
Uh, will you be teaching any undergraduate courses at McMaster on health and, and disease or development? Yeah, so I do, uh, I do lots of guest lectures. The one course that I teach uh, a little bit uh, about this early origin stuff is um, 4MO3. It's, uh, what's it called? Cellular and Integrated Metabolism. I used to uh, I used to coordinate the course, but more, most recently I actually teach a, a scientific writing course. <laughs> so I, which is not about uh, health and disease or development, but it's about uh, honing your scientific writing. And that is three W O three maybe three. Uh, I don't even know, but you can email me and find out if you're interested in scientific writing. Yeah, I mean, if no one else has a question, I'll ask my own. Yeah. Um, it's more to do with the maternal microbial changes that occur during pregnancy. Is that uh -huh. tied closer to nutrient absorption or is it changes to inflammation that uh, affect the placenta or is it something that's direct due to the microbiome changes? Okay, those are really great questions. And actually, we don't know. Um, and, and we well, so there's two answers to that. Number one, uh, the data that I showed you is in mice. So we suspect that what's happening in mice is not quite the same as it is in humans. It's quite controversial, actually, in humans, whether or not microbial populations change in otherwise unremarkable pregnancy. Um, some people have shown that it does. Some people have shown that it doesn't. Actually, our current data in humans suggests that the microbiome doesn't change over the course of pregnancy. But other things do change, like short-chain fatty acids, which are metabolites that microbiota produce. In mice, it does change. Uh, and we actually are not quite sure uh, whether the change is facilitating another, another outcome or is the result of changes in gut um, structural changes that occur with pregnancy because of nutrient an increase in nutrient demand. So right now, we actually don't know. Uh, what I can tell you is that there are changes in the types and abundances of microbes that, that the gut harbors. We know that gut permeability changes with pregnancy, we're not sure why, because an increase in gut permeability should influence and result in inflammation, but you know, uh, maybe there's some sort of immune adaptation that's necessary, necessary in the pregnant gut, uh, just over normal pregnancy that we're not sure about. Uh, so we're looking at mostly signaling factors like short chain fatty acids, which are produced um, by uh, gut bacteria. We're looking at something else called uh, GLP um, glucagon like peptide, which is an endocrine signaling pathway between the gut and the pancreas, because we know the pancreas during pregnancy changes. Um, so it's actually quite quite complex and super unclear, <laughs> actually. Well, thank you anyways. Um, then I, unless anyone else has any other questions. I, I did think have somebody a... has a hand up. Yep, Helen. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I really like it. Um, so just circling back to the graph, when you talked about how um, the early environment is a cycle, through like pre-pregnancy to pregnancy. And when it comes to the fetus developing in, in the in utero development, um, it could also like uh, impact the health of the grandchildren. So I was just wondering, is there any, um, is there any um, effect exerted by programming factors such as environment and diets that can affect those quote unquote parents especially in their gametes or gonads? And would there be like a sex difference considering the difference between male and female? So for um, the male fetus, since oogenesis would begin before birth and would produce primary oocytes already? Yeah, so yes, we have evidence that in um, that there that diet, for example, in, the, in mice that a high fat diet during pregnancy, uh, that fetuses have fewer primordial germ cells in their ovaries. So we know that the, that the germ cells are affected in the fetus 
depending on the model that we're using. We have not looked at males. Males um, also have, have uh, germ cells, right? Stem cells that form in utero, despite the fact that everybody seems to think that, you know, oh, it's all a postnatal thing. Um, like ger the germ cells have to form also. So, so male gonadal development is probably likely affected, but we haven't looked at males in fetuses. But we do know that reproduction in the offspring is significantly altered. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Do we have any other questions? I'll give the chat a second. But other than that, I had someone anonymously message me asking mm -hmm. if you have space in your lab. Oh, <laughs> I unfortunately do not have space in my lab. I have had an overwhelming number of students reach out to me, but I would recommend if anybody's interested to email me about next year uh, or next summer. Um, I don't think I have anybody uh, for next summer yet. So, uh, you know, you can always, it, it doesn't hurt to email me. So, but this year is full because <laughs> we're, we're just about to start. Yeah. Um, and then I guess we'll end on my question. I have so many questions, but <laughs> I'll ask one more to hop off or hop on what Helen said. So does that mean that, oh, potentially, Oh, uh, I don't know how to formulate the question, but I guess I'll ask a different question then. So in terms of the uh, macrophages that are actually developing the um, placental, I guess, arteries, yeah. if, there, if there's an immune response and inflammation occurs, are those um, macrophages then no longer, no longer going to focus on development or are they specific for development and other macrophages yeah. will just take over? Yeah, so there are tissue resident macrophages and then there's those that come from the circulation um, and right now we're trying to figure out whether or not tissue resident immune cells are altered we know that it's probably going to be tissue resident immune cells some changes in circulating you know monocytes and macrophages are occurring and actually oddly neutrophils as well um, but we think that it's probably going to be tissue resident and depending on which tissue you look at. So the decidua will have specialized immune cells that remodel those arteries. Other people have shown that in uh, models of high maternal BMI, that the remodeling doesn't occur properly. And if the remodeling doesn't occur properly, then blood flow is altered. And if blood flow is altered, then placental function is altered. And then eventually fetal development is altered. But th those, are, th those are across a dynamic range. Then there are different, again, different immune cells again that form in the placenta and different parts of the placenta as well. So um, the immunology of pregnancy is actually quite fascinating. I'm not an immunologist, so I always defer to Don Bodish <laughs> to help me through all the different types of immune cells, but we do know that definitely under certain circumstances, those immune cells are not doing their job properly. All right. Thank you so much. And if anyone else has any questions, I recommend emailing Dr. Sloboda. I will put the email once again into the chat for anyone who missed it. But I'd like to give a big thank you to Dr. Sloboda for giving us our talk, the talk for today and for joining us at the OSSA for our lecture series. Great. Thank you again for the invitation. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, and also to answer your question, Abdullah, yes, the, we will be putting our recording to cut it down, to cut out any sort of um, dead air or beginnings and ends and putting it on our YouTube. And also, um, if you want, we can email you a copy directly. Thank you again. Awesome. Thanks.